everyone. Welcome back to Self-Published Success. It's a show that highlights forward-thinking authors who chose self-publishing over traditional and found success in doing so. My name is John Feldman, founder and CEO of Visionary Literary, and your host for today's show. Today's guest is John Leister. John is a self-published author of over 80 books, all written within a few short years. It was only those few short years ago that John found God, and in doing so, he found his passion for writing. Today, he continues to churn out stories, writing, and then self-publishing each one. He also posts updates and shares wisdom on his growing Facebook page, Johnny's Way. John speaks with us today from beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. John, welcome to the show. John, thank you so much. It's great to meet you, and I really appreciate this. Yeah, we are looking forward to uh, speaking with you and hearing more about your background. So why don't you tell us, introduce us more to, you know, you as a person. Um, sure. What, what got you into writing? Okay. Well, I'm 56. And as you said, I live in Vancouver. And I always felt in my life that I was meant to do something creative. When I was a boy, I wanted to be a comic book artist. I had a huge comic book collection and I drew every day. But I got lazy and I gave it up. And then I tried acting for a couple of years. Um, I don't know. You, you look quite young, but there was a show in the late 60s called The Big Valley. And one of the stars of that show, Peter Breck, he came to Vancouver and started an acting school called the Breck Academy. So I tried acting for a couple of years. I had an agent and I was going to auditions. I was an extra in Rocky IV. That was a fun day. I got yeah, oh, the wow. big fight at the end with Ivan Drago was shot at the Agrodome in Vancouver. So there was an open casting call for five to 10,000 extras. So me and my buddy Jeff went and we had a blast. But unfortunately, and I don't mean to gross you or any of your listeners out, I'm just sharing my story. I developed psoriasis, which is something that I think I've always had. I've always had very dry skin. The psoriasis is hereditary. And of course, it's exacerbated by stress and uh, feelings of low self-esteem and, of course, a bad diet. I used to be very overweight. I used to weigh anywhere from 235 to 250 pounds because I was addicted to sugar. I'm a recovering sugar addict. Okay. And one of the constants in my life, sort of sporadically here and there until I was 53, has been writing. I always felt that what I came to this world with was an ability to tell stories. I don't know if they're good, but I know that I like them and I know that I enjoy doing it. And around 2005, I created this character called Lee Hacklin, who's a private investigator. And he's kind of a, a, you know, a quintessential good guy who's a bit rough around the edges. He smokes, he drinks, and he's a skirt chaser. But he's got a heart of gold, and he likes to help people. And I like to think of him as my avatar or sort of an idealized version of myself, which is something that I think a lot of writers do, particularly when they create a heroic character, you know, like Ian Fleming did when he created James Bond or... Tom Clancy when he created Jack Ryan. And I had written these stories around 2005. And I've been a security guard for 35 years, believe it or not. And I was just working at this one site where I was understimulated. And so I just started popping off these short stories. And I had written about 50 or 60 of them. And then I just stuck them in my bedroom where they collected dust for about 15 years. I didn't do anything with them. And then one day about three years ago, and here's where the story for some people might get a little bit off the charts weird, but I came home from work and I, I kind of felt like I was nearing the end of, of, of my rope in life. I don't mean to be melodramatic about it or play the world's smallest violin, but I was feeling very depressed. I've been in therapy. I've read a million uh, self-help books like Anthony Robbins and Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer, you know, Awaken the Giant Within and Unlimited Power. And I found that and I didn't I don't think looking back that doing any of that stuff was a waste of time. I, I feel that I benefited from all of that stuff. But the key element for me, and I'm not trying to get on a soapbox and be pushy or preachy about any of this stuff. I'm just sharing with you and your listeners what worked for me. The key element that was missing was God. And what happened was three years ago, I believe for real, I'm a very empirical fellow. I, you know, I believe in math and science and I believe that two plus two equals four. But I decided to take a leap of faith, and I believe that I had a divine experience. I reached out to God, and he reached out to me, and he kind of patted me on the head, and he said, there, there, John, it's not too late for you. And so I dusted off these Lee Hacklin short stories, and I read them. And I don't know if you do any creative writing. It's very hard to be objective about your own stuff. But I'd written a lot of stuff in my 20s and 30s that is just cringeworthy. It's just I would be embarrassed to if a dog ate it. That's how awful it is. <laughs> but when I read these Lee Hacklin, of course, we're all our own worst critics. Yeah, right. Sure. But when I read these Lee Hacklin stories, 
I really enjoyed them. I thought, gosh, if somebody else had written these, I know I would like them. So I cobbled them together. There he goes, shamelessly plugging his product. They became my first book, which is Lee Hacklin, 1970s Private Investigator, book one. And I'm not a very tech savvy guy. I was alive at a time when none of this stuff existed. So it was a real uphill battle for me to get that first book posted. You know, I kept, you know, the, the Amazon was telling me it was the wrong banking information. And then I would go to the bank and they'd say, no, it's the right information. I was going in circles. And my late motif in life, and again, I don't mean to be overly uh, self-denigrating, but I've not been so much of a, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again kind of guy. Okay. More like try something once or twice. And if it doesn't work out the way that I hope that it will in my imagination, well, I'm just going to go back to sitting on my couch and watching my DVDs and the special features and pounding down one slice of pizza after another which of course is not how successful i mean i knew better intellectually that's not how successful people think you know successful people you know they keep, they keep at it and they keep at it and whatever little hiccups and potholes you know that occur along the way you know you just accept that as part of the journey you know the important thing is that, that you're on the journey that's right for you and so when i finally posted that first book have you seen the movie billy elliott about the boy who wants to be about so that so just as a little little sidetrack it's about a boy who wants to be a ballet dancer and he lives in this very hard bitten mining town in England and it's the 1970s and it's not a very enlightened or politically correct time. And his dad's an alpha male. He's like, what do you want to be a ballet dancer? And, you know, he's very, very, uh, you know, enraged about this, but, you know, spoiler warning, eventually he comes around and he takes Billy to this very prestigious uh, ballet school in London. And the auditioners ask him, well, Billy, how do you feel when you dance? And he says, well, I feel like electricity. And that's how I felt when I posted that first book, which took me about a month. Hmm. And that feeling has become, is was not a, 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 a normal feeling for me. The feeling of starting something and actually crossing the finish line, like actually pushing through the, little, the speed bumps, as opposed to just going back to my comfort zone, which for 35 years, and I don't mean to paint a picture of myself as a recluse or anything like that, but I spent a significant amount of my time just, you know, doing my job, coming home from work, plonking myself down on my couch and watching my VHS tapes. And then after that, my, my DVDs and then a little bit of Netflix here and there. And now I've got about 80 of these books online. I'm working on another one right now. And it's become an, an addiction for me. And I have this, I have this, here's the thing, discovery. You never know what you're capable of doing until you actually do it right. and if you do it every day and if you love what you're doing a funny thing happens you get better at it it's like if you can do one push-up one day you can do two push-ups the next day and i don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence and i'm probably stating the obvious but you know some of us are, are late bloomers and, and i'm very much a late bloomer and i owe it all to god once i reached out to god i began to have this feeling of decompression of, you know it's not like i don't suggest it's anything mystical I think it's more like human nature. When we know that someone who loves us is watching us, I think we tend to want to please that person. And we please that person when we please ourselves by following our bliss. I don't know. Does that make any sense? It does. Yeah. And there are a couple of things right? there too. Like you were, I, I think just going back right to the consistency aspect, right? You, so it took a lot of work for you to get that first book published, which yeah. again is Everything probably at that time was still new and Amazon was still yeah. working out there. Jumping King. into the deep end of the pool. Exactly. But you you still stuck with it even yeah. after. I mean, you published and here's the thing. and then you- if, if, there's, if there's such a thing as parallel timelines, like Star Trek or Back to the Future, if there was a, like a parallel timeline where I did this three years ago and I didn't have God in my life, knowing myself who I was three years ago, I would have given up after two or three tries. I would have said, oh, this is too hard. My ship has sailed. I had my 20s, 30s, and 40s. I've made my choices, you know, and that's fine. Yeah. But because I had God in my life, who I sort of think of as Big Brother from 1984, you know, Big Brother is watching you, but in a good way, you know, in a wonderful way, in a loving way, in a cheering way, kind of like, like Yoda or Obi-Wan or Mickey from the Rocky movies. I mean, imagine Rocky walking into the ring, you know, squaring off against, you know, whether it's Apollo Creed or Ivan Drago, and there's nobody cheering for him. When we have it in our mind's eye that someone loves us all the time, unconditionally, accepts us for who we are as individuals, is cheering for us to manifest the attainable, mm -hmm. ultimate version of ourselves, it's incredibly motivating. I mean, if I didn't have God in my life, I wouldn't be doing this right now. I wouldn't be reaching out to nice people like yourself because I'd have nothing to talk about. 
other than what other people are doing. And I can do that too. I can, you know, I can talk about other people's, you know, books and movies. And I, I love talking about pop culture, but I'd rather talk about my own stuff. It's a lot more satisfying. And I like to think that it inspires other people too. I mean, I yeah. hope so. Yeah. So, and speaking of which, right. So you have three years ago, you went to publish your, your first book, right. And mm. traditionally when you go to research, how do I publish my book? It's go to a traditional publisher. Why did you choose to self-publish even after you ran into those Amazon issues? What chose you to go down that path? Well, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, reaching out to the, doing it the traditional way, it's kind of like if you're an actor and you want, you're looking for an agent, mm -hmm. you go to the agency. The first thing they ask you is, what have you done? Well, I haven't done anything. Well, we're not going to represent you until you've done something. But you're not going to get an audition unless you get an agent. So you have to find a kind of right. So you have to kind of network. You have to you have to meet someone or find a back door like the Matrix. You know, you have to find some secret portal like a video game. You know, to sort of sort of get your foot in the door and get someone to notice you. So I thought with self publishing, I mean, there's no there's no middleman. You know, you just go on the website and you register and and, and it's easy peasy. I mean, it, well, it wasn't for that first month, but then I found uh, another platform. Actually, I gave up on Amazon. I shouldn't say anything negative about Amazon because it seems like they practically rule the world. But I found another platform called draft to digital and the first book. And that's all I use now is draft to digital. And what they do is they springboard. And here's another thing that's great about self-publishing, especially if you use draft to digital, I know they're not paying me. If you post your book on draft to digital, it springboards to different platforms, so like eight or nine different platforms. So all of my books are on Kobo and Barnes and Noble and Apple and, and five or six other platforms. Right. And, I would be more, I'm, you know, look, I want to make money doing this. I want to die a professional writer of creative fiction. I want to be able to ring that bell before my corporeal existence ends. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's about sharing. And I love getting critical feedback from people. And my email is johnleister611 at hotmail.com. And I would be more, and I've done this. I would be more than happy to email anyone, any of my books or my short stories. I also uh, post videos of myself. Uh, reading my stuff on my phone and I post videos on my Facebook page, which, which is John Leister. And as you said, my Facebook group is Johnny's Way, where I write two or three times a week. I write what I hope are uplifting and uh, inspirational essays that, uh, that, are, that I think anybody can get something out of, but particularly people who are my age, you know, people who are middle-aged and maybe kind of feel the way that, that I felt three years ago. It's like, oh gosh, I had all these chances and I had all these opportunities and I was just, and all I wanted to do was goof around, you know, get, go out and get bombed with my buddies and, and, you know, go to movies or sit at home or watch DVDs and say tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then you wake one day and you're in your fifties and you go, oh, oh crap, you know, my ship is still. No, you know, someone once said, if you haven't made it by the time you're 30, you never will. Part of my mission statement is to prove, thank you. Part of my <laughs> mission statement in life is, is to prove that to be a bunch of BS. It is. Right. As long as you, you reason, I mean, I think you have to be reasonably healthy and I think you have to have one or two wits about you. But if you have that passion, then then let it out, because when you and I'm, I'm just I'm not you know, I don't want to be throwing stones in a glass house or judging other people. I'm speaking for myself when we when I held all of that passion inside of myself, I suffered. And, it, and I'm sure that it made my psoriasis a lot worse because I believe that how we feel about ourselves uh, has a direct, um, you know, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. And again, I'm just speaking from my own experience. How we feel about ourselves has a direct correlation with our physical health. So for example, my arm, you see my arm? Yeah. It looks pretty normal now, right? We used to be all white and scaly, like a, like a reptile. And it doesn't do a lot, you know, I mean, psoriasis is not the worst thing in the world. There are worse things, but it certainly doesn't do a lot for a person's confidence. Right. And particularly when it comes to romantic relationships. So you know, when I was acting and I was going to auditions and pieces of skin were falling off my, my face and I was going, I had various treatments and, and not getting very much positive out of that. I just kind of said to myself, I had it in my mind's eye. Well, I guess I'm just going to be a blue collar worker for the rest of my life. I'm just going to make enough money to, to, to keep my head above the water. And, and I guess this is my, this is my place in life. And every so often I would have a moment of clarity, particularly when I'd be watching a, a special feature. Did you, did you ever watch special features on DVDs? Like, like, you know, the, the, the bloopers yeah. and the, the deleted scenes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, the times. writer's room. My favorite special feature was always the writer's room yeah. where you see yeah. the directors and the producers in there. And they're talking about next week's episode of 24. And I'd be sitting in my in my apartment 
on my ratty couch, pounding down my KFC. <laughs> it's a wonder I didn't give myself type two diabetes. And, um, and that's another thing after I reached out to God, my diet changed like 180 degrees. Like suddenly vegetables started looking really attractive to me. Like I just, I think that when you love yourself, you're yeah. just more motivated to make better choices in life. Yeah. But if you don't love yourself, if you, if you have this self-loathing, then you're, you, you know, you're likely going to make, you know, you might, you know, you might drink more or you might in, in more severe cases. I think that's why people take hard drugs. Like why would someone stick a needle in their arm knowing in advance that it's going to shorten their life by decades? Yeah. They're doing it. And I'm not a mind reader. I know I'm all over the place here, but they're doing it because they're suffering, right? They're suffering so much emotionally that they have to do something and in their, in their distorted mind. That's going to snap them out of all the pain that they're in for, for that moment of pleasure, even though that they, that they know that the negative in the long term, you know, outweighs that that, that instant gratification positive. Right. right. Yeah. So talk about that. Right. You, you talk a lot about about mindset and like mm -hmm. your mindset and like for, for anyone who is who maybe thinks that they are past their prime or um, needs a little bit of, you know, mental health help right like what what does writing do for you is that oh escape? well i mean i think that it's very therapeutic okay i think i have a sense that i'm i always have a sense that i'm creating something that didn't exist before right, right. and so for example um one of my books is called the treehouse avengers and it's very autobiographical it's about a boy named clint wagner who's overweight and he's insecure and he's a comic book nerd and he's kind of a charlie brown kind of kid and he has a very abusive father, as, as I had an abusive father as I was growing up. I don't mean to throw him under the bus. He's not here to defend himself. He was a great provider, and he had his moments. But he had a terrible, terrible temper, and he had this very thick German accent. And so I wrote a scene in that book where Clint's father is being, uh, he's getting the crap knocked out of him by this other character who's a school principal who befriends Clint and is having an affair with Clint's mom. And he, his intention is to take Clint out of this abusive environment and he winds up getting into a fist fight with Clint's dad in front of his his dad and I had to ask myself as I was writing this because my dad was a very he was an capital A alpha male like he was a real gen he was like a real life he was like another Charles Bronson and I'm, I'm he was and he knew it and he and he liked that he had that kind of face like he was my stepfather he was now my biological father but he had like I have a very soft you know I was pretty boy as a young man he had a very hard Steven Seagal kind of face and, and he, he milked that to the nth degree. He always had to be the toughest guy in the room. You know, a lot of people say to me, God, your dad's handshake. Like, I can't, I can't move my, like he had, he just yeah. had to, he had, you know, he had to piss on every tree, you know, to establish his territory kind of thing. And so when I wrote this, the scene of him getting beaten up, I had to ask myself, well, you know, how would I have felt if this had actually happened in my real life? And I realized a part of me would have been thrilled to see it because i'd be thinking well dad you know you created the situation you know you you were the instigator and this is your comeuppance but at the same time i'd probably be crying because at the end of the day he's still my dad yeah right yeah. because i think that we're going to love our parents no matter what they did to us and if they did something to us that was really awful we can forgive them it doesn't mean that we have but that doesn't mean that we have to be around them but we have to forgive them for our own peace of mind so yeah i can see and, that the therapeutic avenue there. Right. Hey, so yeah. writing that was kind of a, it was kind of a purging. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, I was bullied as a kid, you know, I was, you know, in movies that the kid who is bullied tends to be the little guy, the little weak skinny guy. Well, I was very often the biggest guy in class. I'm a pretty tall guy and I was a gentle giant. You know, I wanted to be everybody's friend. I wanted everybody to love me. And so I was a very, and I wasn't good at sports. I had no emotional interest. I, I had nothing against sports. I just, I came to this planet without that gene. I mean, I like to work out and I, I play tennis back in the day, but with like watching team sports, rooting for the home team, I just don't have that in me. I just don't have that, that interest. So no, and so no I was hockey very, for you as a Canadian. No, I got that a lot as a kid. Are you, what, you don't watch hockey. Are you yeah. Canadian? Yes, I'm Canadian. I just, I have nothing against it. I like Star Trek. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch uh, Superman with George Reeves. Yeah. And so, I was a very attractive bully. I was a very, no, I was a very attractive target for bullies and I never stood up for myself. And so all of my stories, most of them, I'm going to say all of them, they have what I like to think anyway, are, are very strong protagonists. And my antagonists are uh, essentially irredeemable bullies who get pleasure out of 
harming other people. And they all get their karma. They all get their comeuppance. And that's the kind of world that I want to live in. And I think that we do live in that world to some degree, but there's a lot of injustice in the world too. And I had a sense growing up that the bad kids, that the, the, the kids who were the like were not good, were very often got away with a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I think that we all feel that way sometimes. And so when you're when you write, and I think that's what Gene, I don't know if you like Star Trek, but I think that's what Gene Roddenberry did when he created Star Trek back in the day. You know, he you know, Star Trek is not about aliens and spaceships and warp speed and photon torpedoes. It's about setting a standard for how people ought to be or at least in Gene Roddenberry's mind, or, or the Brady Bunch is another example. I mean, I, I, I loved the Brady Bunch as a kid. Do you know that show? I do, yeah. Okay, okay, because cool. so, you're a young guy. Yeah. And so everybody made fun of that show, and I would watch it, and I would think, well, what are people making fun of? These are idealized people. I would love to know these people. I would love these people to be my next door neighbors. I love to hang out with Greg and Peter and Bobby. They're nice kids. You know, they're friendly. And if there's a problem, you know, they don't fall to pieces. And that's another thing. When we grow up in environments, and again, I should I don't mean to throw my parents under the bus because they're not here to defend themselves. And they were they were good, loving people in a lot of ways. But my mom and dad, they, they tended to fall to pieces over every little crisis that was not necessarily a crisis, just one of life's little hiccups. Right. And I think that some kids... So, I mean, some kids are stronger than others. Some kids are able to look at that and go, okay, well, this is how not to behave. I see how mom and dad are behaving and I'm going to do the opposite of that. But I, and I had a little bit of that, but it wasn't enough. It would, I think I absorbed a lot of that. Yeah. And so those, those feelings also contributed to my not making as much effort as I could have when I was a younger man. To, to manifest my dreams. Well, it still seems like now you're able to take all of this, all of all of the emotional buildup over the years, all of the situations that you've been in have all helped you, especially as a fiction writer, oh, helped you to create these characters and these stories. So, and it, all, it seems to be therapeutic as well. So it, it all, everything absolutely. seems to be um, going well for you. Again, 80 books that you've written and you've published. Uh, I know you touched on it a bit before, but where else can people find you and your work? Okay. Well, if you go to Indigo Books, and if you search John Leister, J-O-H-N, my last name is L as in Lion, L-E-I-S-T-E-R, you can see all my books. You can see my whole library, and you can read the first chapter for free. And like I said, I would be more than willing to email. And there, and, and again, anybody who wants to do this, and is, is anybody listening to this podcast, who's thinking, gosh, I'd like to write a book too. Use draft to digital and there's another website called um, Poster My Wall where you can design your own book covers. I just recently added covers to my books like over the last year and I've actually gotten some story ideas based on yeah. the images on the website. Like I saw an image of a mushroom cloud yeah. and I went, oh, there's a nuclear bomb in New York City and Lee has 24 hours to find it. That's the next book. Army get down and boogie. Boom. Right. And um, so, yeah, uh, Indigo Books, my Facebook page is John Leister and my group page is Johnny's Way. And my my web my my email is John Leister, as I said already, J J O H N L E I S T E R six one one at hotmail dot com. And I would be and and I I emailed another writer uh, one of my books recently, and he said and it was my but my favorite email of all time. He wrote me back a super detailed review, and like like referenced the things that he liked, and then referenced the things that he thought were maybe some of my weaker points. Like I'm not I'm not a very descriptive writer. You know, I, I, there was one of my biggest influences. Are you familiar with a writer named Robert B. Parker? No. Do you know who that is? He created a character called Spencer, which was a movie recently with Mark Wahlberg, Spencer Confidential. Okay. And so Spencer is a private detective, and he's sort of Lee Hackman's father. And I remember reading these books back in the day, and, and Robert B. Parker, who's no longer with us, sadly, he has a very punchy, sort of in-your-face, almost semi-comical writing style, where Spencer is, is, is a very quintessential you know, square jawed hero and, and the other characters are more nuanced and idiosyncratic and, and have gray areas. And I remember reading these books back in the day, thinking, and, and also written from the first person narrative, which is how I write. I like a first person narrative. I like getting into the mind of yeah. the hero. And I just remember thinking, well, I can do this. You know, I'd watch Quentin Tarantino movies and Kevin Smith movies back in the day, yeah. you know, the, the clerks and they're talking about Star Wars. And I remember looking at this going, well, I, I, I could do that. I mean, I don't know if I could do it as well. I could, I don't know if I could do it one billionth as well. But at the end of the day, and I think this is another important message, just turn off anybody out there who wants to do that, do this, turn off that self-critical switch yes. in your mind, because that's going to be a robot. 
just enjoy doing it. I'm at a point in my life now where if I went to bed without writing at least a page of single space in my notebook, which is in my knapsack right now, it would be like going to bed without brushing and flossing my teeth. Like this is who I am right now. And every time I I open my notebook and I start writing, I have a general idea of where the story is going. But once I start writing, it goes in different in directions that I didn't anticipate. Yeah. Like I'll create one character that I think is initially is very sympathetic, but they tr- later on they turn out to be the killer yeah. or vice versa. I'll create a character. who's like the total a-hole, but then later on turns out actually to be, to have some, some good qualities, right. right? Again, it's that feeling of discovery. And I think that it's such a great metaphor for life. You just, you just have to get out there and do it. And if it's not in you to do it, like if I had, if I had to will myself to write, then I wouldn't do it. Right. It's just, it's just, it, this is what I came to earth with and better late than never. Here I am doing it now <laughs> and it's, awesome. it's worth it. And it's not too late. And I'm going to keep cranking. I've got, you know, three or four more ideas on my phone and and with the internet now, yeah. no one should ever get writer's block. Right. <laughs> right. There, there's a million billion stories out there, but I like to think that most of what I write comes out of my imagination and my life experiences and my perceptions. Yeah. Anyway, I'm babbling. <laughs> no, that's fine. And that's a good message. I like that that ending note there is just be consistent. Um, yeah. Put away your, your thoughts, any kind of like imposter syndrome or ideas that you're not good enough. Just start writing, start cranking it out and be consistent. So this has been I great. have it in my mind's yeah. eye now that when I start writing in the next hour or two, I'm going to laugh. I'm yeah. going to cry. I'm going to feel excited. I'm going to feel a sense of tension. And if I'm 90, if I, if I'm lucky enough to live to be 90 and I still don't have any sort of a following or a readership at the end of the day, it makes me happy and it gives me a feeling of purpose. That's and awesome. I, I know in my heart, mind and soul that I'm doing exactly what I can see you looking at the time there. I guess we're coming to an end pretty soon, but folks, follow your bliss and enjoy the journey. And yeah. just there's going to be hiccups and potholes along the way, but you know, never mind the destination. And I wasn't enjoying the journey of my life during the first 53 years, but now I am. And if I wasn't, then I wouldn't be reaching out to nice people like yourself. That's awesome. Well, John, thank thank you you so much. Thank you for all the insight. Uh, Best of luck as you continue to churn out stories. You too. Um, Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll stay in touch. So thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you. Bye, John.